all about our wonderful neighborhood. Maybe a little background back back in the old days, mm -hmm. the way it used to be. Yeah. And we're so delighted to have you and we're looking forward to this. We've been talking about this for a long time, so you're here. And I'm glad you all came. Okay. Take it away. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. I'm going to try sitting down in a minute because I want to be able to hold some notes. I have some. I live in the other block of Yosemite, the 1900 block of Yosemite, so I am your neighbor. Um, and this interest in neighborhood history came with me from college, and I landed in the, the house on that block, and in 1977, uh, the Berkeley Architectural Heritage said, well, could you do an architectural walking tour of Thousand Oaks? And I said, well, I don't really think there's enough. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> and but I'll I'll see. So I started knocking on doors, making phone calls. Remember, there's no other way to contact people except in writing in those days. And I was very lucky in my timing because some of the people who had lived here in the early days were still around, or someone who lived here was around, and someone who knew them and could give me a reference. And I was able to collect a lot of really interesting information. So it, it was a lesson in never, never say there isn't enough information. There's plenty of information. Um, and it's, this block is really at the heart of the neighborhood. So I hope you're very proud of that and that you know that. Um, it's not called Yosemite just casually. The name was picked very carefully. Think of all the rocks you have on this block. Think of Stoneface. Um, so the developers of Thousand Oaks knew what they were doing. Um, and we'll talk about the rest of the development and how this all came about um, with some slides. Maybe a ghost. No, I just didn't show it all. Okay, so let's start. I, um, I, I am a founding member of the Berkeley Architectural Heritage Association. Um, I was served as on the Landmarks Commission and as chair. And I just love local history and architecture. So I've done a lot of writing and talking about it. And for 10 years, I gave walking tours for the Berkeley Public Library. Um, finally decided after 10 years it was time to retire from that. <laughs> but thank you. Good. Um, okay, so. There are two things I'd like you to think about, but let's, and one is the kind of fascinating thing about trying to find some order in the city. I didn't know when I started digging around that there was really a story here, but it turns out there is a story. Um, and the other one is, the other quote that I really love is, it's not what you look at, think about what you look at every day, but what you see. And so I hope, as a result of tonight and our conversation and the things we talk about, you'll see the neighborhood and see this block and maybe the blocks around you in a different way. Because there, as I said, there's a great story here. So let's get started, turn on the slides. I don't know if I can start it from here. I can't. Thank you. <laughs> Try that, yeah. <laughs> okay, so power, power. There you go. There we go. Bravo. <laughs> so this, this, it's vintage technology. Well, this is weird. When June Hunt, when June Hunt asked me if I could do this talk, I said yes, but I can't do it on a PowerPoint. <laughs> so I needed to borrow a projector, and luckily a projector and a screen have been provided for tonight, so I hope you understand. Because I love to play around with my slides and I didn't want to make it in a, a set format um, for another time. So this is a part of an advertising brochure mm -hmm. from about 1916, 15 or 16, for the Thousand Oaks neighborhood. And what do you notice there? Do you notice? No bridge. No bridge. <laughs> That's very astute. I noticed the a very large urn. Yeah. Um, I also noticed an oak tree and a fabulous view. And then looking out over the over the bay, um, and I think this artwork is just wonderful. And artwork like this paid, paid played a real part.
part in the development and the popular, popularizing of this neighborhood. But let's start with some questions. So remember I said I didn't think there was really enough for a walking tour. I knew that there was a rock up here and a sign that said Stoneface Park, but where, where was the stone face? Do you see it? I couldn't find it. I knew that we had a pathway. You and your block have a pathway. Indian Trail. But what was that all about? I knew that at the bottom of Indian Trail, there was a big cement pot. But why was it there? There was only one, and um, so that was something worth asking about. And why was there a street called Station Place? You're being very quiet. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. <laughs> um, so these were some of the puzzles. And then there was another one. <laughs> the mouth of the tunnel on the Solano side was stamped 1910. Now this was intriguing to me. You can see I like to wander around mm -hmm. and find some puzzles. But, you know, what happened in 1910 and what did that mean? So let's see if we can solve some of those. I know you know the answers to some of those. And also something like this. This is Vincenti, and this neighborhood is full of walk beautiful walking paths. Um, and I thought they were charming, but did they, you know, why were they here? We have more than almost any other neighborhood. And why and what? was this big white pile up above the Arlington. The girls' school. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry? The girls' school. Yes, it was a girls' school. It was Williams College. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly imposing, and it doesn't look like anything else. <laughs> the scale is incredible. So let's go back to before all these things happened. This is a picture of North Berkeley at the turn of the century open grassland. Um, you see some cattle grazing there. Just open hillside with oaks um, in, the, in the swales, creeks, but not very many trees. And about that same time, if you stood on the corner of Vine and Shattuck, um, you, would have, you could have seen this. This is called Berryman Station. Um, and if you look over at that corner, there's still a couple of Victorian, what were Victorian buildings that have witches caps on them. Mm -hmm. um, but this was the end of the steam train line. That was as far as you could go on public transportation from Oakland into Berkeley. And the, the border of Berkeley at this time was um, Eunice. And that was, that was the edge of town. And it was, the town was pretty much laid out, except for some additions over by the Claremont after the turn of the century in a grid pattern. So a rectangular, rectilinear pattern of streets. Um, so I want to read you a quote, something I, I really love from a book um, that was called The Berkeley Year. And it was published in 1898. And um, was written by a man, this walk was written by a man named Cornelius Beach Bradley. And I was delighted when I found this. It was so much fun in the Bancroft Library. And here's what he said. And listen carefully, because it does relate to our very neighborhood. To one quaint nook I would offer to conduct my reader. The place is called Boswell's. Our visit shall be on some bright morning in April. Our um, we take the train to Berryman Station and zigzagging thence northward, we are soon clear of the thin fringe of dwelling houses and are out among the fields. Our course has been af af hmm. as if for Peralta Park, and that's where St. Mary's High School is now, mm -hmm. Monterey Market area. Mm -hmm. There's a cluster of Victorian houses around there, mm -hmm. and there was a small Victorian development. So that would have been visible even from the Berryman Station area. But instead of turning toward it, we cross a bridge and follow the country lane northward. 
We continue over fields and fences and across two little waterways. And beyond those, we reach a broad slope, thickly strewn with rocks and boulders, hmm. and dotted with low trees and shrubs. This is Boswell's. This untamable, rock-strewn area has become a veritable sanctuary for plants and living creatures that could not maintain themselves out in the open. And he talks about wildflowers, ever-changing vistas, rocks of striking size, and, and here it lies in full view of bay and town, far from the workaday world. That's right here, I think. Mm -hmm. Kind of exciting to find a description of your neighborhood before it was a neighborhood. There were beautiful wildflowers, and some of the early Mr. Mr. Wentworth was was still alive and living next to Stoneface Park when I started this project, and he talked about the Johnny jump ups and all the wildflowers, and so did his contemporaries. So this is for them, and also it's still April. So I'm just going to interrupt you for a minute. When I moved here, his mother yes. lived right over there in the in Cynthia house. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> so this this is Picnic Rock. Do you know where Picnic Rock is? Mm -hmm. um, on Menlo Place yeah. and Santa Rosa. Oh, yes. And these are some picnickers. I don't know what they're doing up there, but I was very excited to find a picture of them. Yeah, right. So that's one of the big rocks in our neighborhood. But what happens? Well, first of all, electric train transportation is introduced to the East Bay. And first it serves the, the south side of town. Um, and this becomes a big population jump. So in Let's see, 1900, Berkeley had 13,000 people. By 1906, it had 28,000. And one year later, 1907, it had 40,000 people. You know what happened between 1906 and 1907, but that's a huge increase in population. Um, so there was, it was a moment of great civic pride starting at the turn of the century. The university was building. Um, and you can see this. I like to call this lovely lady Miss Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> the Claremont area was developed in 1905. And I want you to make notes of these gates and lanterns. So this would be on Claremont Boulevard across from the Star Grocery. You probably know that area. Um, but this, this civic art, these civic art features, these great walk pillars and the lanterns, um, were definitely part of that kind of a planned development. Um, and it was right on, and the Claremont Hotel would be at the end of the electric train line that went up um, Claremont Avenue. But you can see beyond, I haven't looked at this picture for a while, beyond the stone pillars, you see the open hillsides there? Mm -hmm. yeah. So here are the electric trains in downtown Berkeley little after the turn of the century. You can see it looks very different. Lots of witches caps there. And this is Charles Keeler. And I put him in a slide of Mr. Keeler in because his idea was that Berkeley was changing rapidly. He was a friend of Bernard Maybach's. He had ideas about what should be built on Berkeley hillsides that houses should fit the contours of the hills, they should be in natural colors that would be um, nice with the surrounding lands, natural landscape. He wrote a book called The Simple Home, and he was a founder of the Hillside Club, which still stands on Cedar Street in North Berkeley. But they actually had many ideas about development and <laughs> home building, and I put this in because there really was a conversation about what should be built. We don't have that conversation very much now. We have conversations about what we don't like sometimes, <laughs> uh, or what we don't think should happen, but this was some of that, but also a more positive, what was appropriate, what would work, and I think that that really shaped the consciousness of many people who were going to then later build houses. So, 
Of course, Tiffany may have a little. <laughs> um, many of you have probably heard this story, but it's a story I love. And I only came across it, uh, this cap the chap to move the capital of Berkeley, because in one of the standard Berkeley history textbooks, it says the capital was to be moved to Thousand Oaks. And I kept <laughs> looking. Thousand Oaks, really? Thousand Oaks? Hmm. And I spent one, a long time reading one entire year of the Berkeley Gazette, the 1907 issue, to see what I could find out. It was fun. The paper is crumpling, but I would turn these big pages. They were bound. Um, and came across this story, and here it is. The year, it's so in, in the spring of 1907, there was a movement to move the capital to Berkeley but it wasn't actually to be in Thousand Oaks. It was to be very close to Thousand Oaks, right about where the North Bray Church is now. So in that piece of land, up to the circle. And the circle, where the fountain is now, was to be the grand entrance to the state capitol. Mm -hmm. But 40 acres is not a very big site. And, um, but the land was offered. There was a statewide referendum. It only passed in three counties, I think Alameda and San Francisco among them. Uh, Sacramento really wanted to hold on to the um, state capitol. LA was not in favor of this. And I'm frankly very glad we don't have the university and the state capitol squeezed into all of them. It would be a very, very different place. Um, there's also a great story about the liquor lobby not wanting the capitol in Berkeley because Berkeley was a dry city. Um, and of course, that was the argument that some people used for moving it here. <laughs> but here's a, here's a map from the Bancroft Library. I was very excited the day I found this, and it shows you the Capitol site. And I think you can, you can see here, um, and the circle is the current circle that we recognize. And I think that that's the Alameda that is the line across the bottom. But here's how you can know you're in the right place, North Bray Church. And I know many of you have probably seen this picture, but it's such a great, a great photo. It's the dedication of the fountain. So the capital measure doesn't pass. Um, Mesa McDuffie, who decided to develop the land, they had developed North Bray, which the, was the adjoining subdivision, and they named all the streets in North Bray after ca counties in California, as you probably mm -hmm. know. Um, but they um, developed this circle with a f fountain, very much like the fountain we have now, and this was the dedication of that fountain in 1911. Mm -hmm. So this is a group of, of people there. The fountain was there from 1911. It was fed by a natural spring. There was spring water underneath it. Mm -hmm. um, and then in, in late 1950s, a truck coming down Moran crashed into it, and that was the end of that fountain. Mm -hmm. City took it out, didn't save the pieces, nobody had the plans, and some of you will remember, it's just a kind of a messy bunch of bushes and a few uh, mm -hmm. traffic diverters. But in the 1990s, a group of North Berkeley citizens got together to try to, to bring the fountain back, and they did, and since 1996, we have had a fountain in that circle. And it, it is amazing how much better it looks and how right it looks to have it there. Um, so that's a replica fountain with balustrades around it that were designed by John Galen Howard, the campus architect. Hmm. Well, the, cap the capital is not moving here, um, and there is this very nice land that was going to be adjacent to the capital, um, and so it is put on the ballot in 1908 as a potential city park. And this, this is described from this, also from the Gazette, seen in the old Indian burial ground. Mm -hmm. That's our neighborhood. Now, that idea did not pass. It lost by six votes. So, the owner of the property, John Spring, then developed the property. Spring's mansion was that big white mansion, as you all know, I'm sure, that later became a girls' school, um, up just up above the Arlington. 
he was, he owned a quarry in Cerrito Canyon. We'll see a picture of that in a minute. And he had been a partner of, Mace, of Duncan McDuffie and had worked on developing both the Claremont um, and some of the other large Mason McDuffie subdivisions, including North Bray. But he was not, Thousand Oaks was to be his project alone, although Duncan McDuffie was involved at the very beginning. And there is a story that uh, John Spring uh, lost the Claremont Hotel in a game of dominoes. You know, that was unfinished for 10 years. They, they couldn't finish it. Finally, they did. So he turned his sights to North Berkeley. Let's see if we can make that any sharper. That's better. And this is his quarry in our canyon to the north. And he, he, he was used the rock that he got from the quarry, crushed it, and used it for macadamizing roads. So he had an interest in developing new roadways as well. Mm. This is the first brochure for Thousand Oaks. So we have, um, around the circle is the North Bray area with all the stri streets that have um, county names. And then on Arlington, there's a stone bridge and there's a creek, and that's the border between North Bray and Thousand Oaks on that side. On the north is the, is the canyon, Cerrito Canyon. And then the first part of Thousand Oaks went down to Calusa, and it went up as far as Arlington. Eventually, mm -hmm. Spring developed land all the way up to Spruce. He owned a lot of land. But to make this a viable project, he had to bring some kind of transportation north. And the key route, uh, the uh, key route system had the the rights to the Alameda. They were not going to share, and so the plan was made to make a tunnel to Solano. Hmm. And it was a cut and fill project. And this is the Solano tunnel under construction. Hmm. So next time you are at the circle or walk up those steps alongside the tunnel or go through the tunnel, this is what. This is how it was created. I do worry about the houses that sometimes there are on top of it. <laughs> and then the trains on Solano. Um, this would be later, of course, probably the 20s, maybe early 30s, and you will notice the name of the market, Park and Shop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, currently Safeway. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's Solano, um, that, and the answer to the question of why was there, a, why is there a street named Station Place? It's because the electric station that powered the north end of the Southern Pacific Line was right there on Solano, and that street led into it. It's not there anymore. It's just a little bit, what's where the theater would be now. Hmm. So let's, let's look a little bit at, at this Thousand Oaks area. And I know that you can't read the bottoms of these. Um, but basically what this one says is, for 20 years the Knoll of Thousand Oaks has been the children's playground. And you can see, I think this is right around Stone Face, maybe a little bit up. I've tried to figure this out, coming down from Arlington on San Fernando, where this picture might have been taken. But you can see that it looks out over a very unbuilt up area and then onto the bay beyond. And there's our stone face. Oh. oh. <laughs> oh it's, it's still there if you look hard. I'll be damned. But the trees have really grown to obscure it. And I don't know if, I don't think this is the case, but someone suggested that maybe this picture has been doctored a little bit. But well, you can sure see it there. Yeah, I think it's... A big one. Yeah. It doesn't look like the same rock to me at all. It doesn't, but, but the trees are very different now. Mm -hmm. And currently, they're really covering that, the part yeah. that would be the profile of the face. Well, and it may be looking, yeah, through the glade. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't so. see it anymore. No, you no. couldn't possibly see it now. I don't think you can. Yeah, well... Now we have a mystery. <laughs> I 
next adventure will be to go with the so <laughs> Next adventure with your binoculars. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, the nose part is a little. Cool. I, I remember, you know, standing, looking at this rock, and thinking, maybe the face is on the side. You know? That's what I always thought it was. The and I, I had convinced myself until I found this picture that that was the face. Yeah. Well, the nose may be, uh, you know, way beyond into that other glade. Of, you know, they probably did doctor it a little bit to make sure it was. Or maybe all our kids climbing on that rock they were the nose. Or maybe the nose is broken off. Who knows? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and so these were, for the purposes of finding out how things were done and what was here before, we are lucky that the sales did not proceed very quickly because two years after the earthquake, the Thousand Oaks was opened in 1909 um, and then parts added to it through about 1912. But starting about 1908, there was a recession. There had been a big boom after the earthquake, a building boom. Um, but things really calmed down, and there wasn't as much built. And so it grew. The, this neighborhood grew very slowly. Um, but what a, what a subdivider would do at that point would be to put in the to to put in the streets, to have a landscape engineer lay out the streets, to put in the streets, to put to mark the lots and then the lots would be sold and the individual buyer would select a builder, an architect, and the houses would be built. And so the idea was to have enough of a sense, an aesthetic sense that there would be a harmonious whole and there were some restrictions of setbacks and price restrictions, um, but there was, there was no design review or anything. Oh, I love the no Asiatics, Mongolians, yes. or Africans. That's really interesting. That still appears. I can't in believe the title they actually put that. What? That still That's appears right. if you look at your title report. For it that. does, but it expired. That those had limits, and they expired um, by the late twenties or the thirties. They're wow. still in the. If you look in your deed, you find to go back and back and back. You can find it, but it has an absolutely no impact now, and it hasn't. Grown. How many of you have seen this? Some of you have seen this map before, yeah, I think. Um, I was so excited the day I knocked on a door on San Juan and asked a few questions from a woman who lived there. And she said, oh, wait a minute, I have something I think would help you. Went upstairs to her attic, I think. I don't know where she went. Came back down with this map. Ooh. And so this is the whole map of the Thousand Oaks development. And I want you to notice several things. You see the, cur the curving streets, some straight streets, some curving streets. Um, there are several places where there are oak trees in the middle of the streets. Some of those still exist, but not too many. And you may not be able to read the street names, but they are totally, many of them are very different from they are now, what they are now. Thousand Oaks was Escondido. My block of Yosemite was San Rafael. Um, let's see. Almeda, San something. Yeah. Most of the streets had, I, I brought a copy of that map, a yellowed copy, and we'll be happy to put it out later. Mm -hmm. um, most of the streets had Spanish names, uh, and some of that has changed over time. When Thousand Oaks was annexed, this is all part of the county of Alameda. It's not part of the city of Berkeley until 1920. And when it was annexed to the city of Berkeley, some of the names were changed. Was Yosemite street? Yeah, Yosemite, your block of Yosemite was always Yosemite. And I think it was called Yosemite because it has the, had the many rocks. big rocks and stone face. It's yeah. on the upper left corner. What? Uh, she's probably looking for Yosemite, maybe, on there. Are you looking for Yosemite? I was, no. We're right up here. <laughs> I think. Is that correct? Here, let me. <laughs> well, here's, here's the part. Uh, oh, so it is different. That's his that's yeah, that's I couldn't read it either. Part, <laughs> this, this part is Lover's Lane. <laughs> and then, 
Sorry about that. That's the other part of you said that. Yeah. My glasses. The back Alameda up. was the Alameda. San Lorenzo, yeah. Calusa, Escondido for Yosemite, and like there's a San Diego here. There are many yeah. different things happening. Yeah, that makes more sense, doesn't it? <laughs> But I really think that this block has always been right at the heart of the neighborhood. And one of the tenets of the Hillside Club was gracefully curving streets to fit the contours of the, of the hillside. And here's an example from one of those early brochures. And then this one, a vista down Escondido Tamil Pius in the distance. And even now when I'm out walking, I love walking down Thousand Oaks and seeing Mount Tamil Pius, especially late in the day. It's very beautiful. And you can see the oak trees there. They did a lot of blasting to get roadways through, but as we know, they left a lot of the rocks too. The landscape architect that they hired was a man named Mark Daniels. And another reason that this block is important is that Daniels selected what is now 1864 as the site for his house, which he built. Um, he was a young man who graduated from Cal about 1905 and um, was an en a civil engineer, but then became a, a landscape engineer, laying out subdivisions, and later went on to lay out Bel Air and and St. Francis Wood in San Francisco, and then in the 20s he became an architect. And I think he's the one who was responsible for the design of the urns that were the signature detail of this neighborhood. And here they are. These are two that were at the top of uh, Indian Trail. So that's what the top of Indian Trail looks like before those uh, trees, the big are they cedar trees that are there? Redwood. Um, There's some redwoods there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> On the Searles property, there's redwoods. On the Searles property, yeah. <laughs> but the, these, um, these urns, you know, North Bray has pillars, if you can imagine in front of the a North Berkeley Library those big stone pillars. Cragmont, a subdivision farther up, um, has stone pillars as well. And the markers for Thousand Oaks, as many of you know, <coughs> were urns. And I think they were very important, especially when, when there were no houses here, or very few houses, because they showed you, if, if you came out to visit, and perhaps look at a lot, where the neighborhood, would, where the Thousand Oaks would be. And there's a lot of <coughs> wonderful sketching done. So I think this is a very romantic drawing of Indian Trail from the bottom. <coughs> and now here's a, a historic photo from one of those brochures of the Spring Mansion. It had 20 acres of gardens around it. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea was that this would be a draw. People would take the train. And, come for Sunday, take the trolley on Arlington or come out for a Sunday drive and they would visit John Springs' magnificent garden, which was laid out, by the way, by Mark Daniels. <coughs> and the house itself was designed by John Hudson Thomas, who um, turned out to be extremely uh, prolific and designed many houses in Thousand Oaks. And here's another shot of that garden, historical picture. And just next time you're on Arlington, imagine um, that it once looked like this. There are days when I, when I wish I had the energy to start to work with the city to see if we could get some better landscaping on Arlington. It used to be a lot nicer. And um, they're not taking very good care of it very right now. But the idea was to have a two-level boulevard with a trolley on one side, <laughs> automobile traffic on the other, and beautifully planted so that it would really be a grand boulevard. So this is a little bit, I think this picture is a little bit, it's a postcard actually, north of the circle. Mm -hmm. And I want to 
wanted you to see this as well. This is John Spring's home, later Williams Institute. Um, and there, are, there were urns on every intersection of Arlington. Hmm. How many total urns? I, heard I have tried to figure that out. I heard that they number. were 20, maybe? Oh, I thought there were many more than that. Well, it's hard to know. Yeah. But this is, um, I think, San Antonio. Hmm. So let's just talk about a little bit more about this block. So the some of the earliest buildings were right here, and I think this is the first house that was built in Thousand Oaks in 1910. Um, this is the right. It's, it's the Levine's house. It's on Indian Trail, and it was designed by a San Francisco architect named William Knowles. Um, and here you see it all by itself. And not so many trees around it. It was very different. And there it is from another angle. Um, I think they photographed it. I've, I've seen lots of pictures of this house, and they photographed it from many different angles, making it appear mm -hmm. as though there was there were more houses. <laughs> well, yeah, there's one back there. <laughs> two urns at the top of, those, of the Indian Trail. These massive urns guarding the upper end of Indian Trail weigh together three tons. And you can see the view, you get a different sense of the view in these pictures oh, as well. Yeah. Because as the trees have grown up, a lot of that view has been obscured. Mm -hmm. But it was really much, much more open. Now, Mark Daniels' house, this is a very old picture. Mm -hmm. I think the garden's a little different now. Um, but I think that Daniels chose this lot, or maybe was given this lot as in payment for his work mm -hmm. as the landscape engineer. Um, but maybe it's just that he knew it was such a fabulous spot and he wanted mm -hmm. it. But the house is set way down from the street because it has to be tucked in. But it's a great example of a rustic house that's following the dictates of the hillside club to, to fit into the contour of the hill. And the, uh, you know, the Charles Keeler would have liked the brown, the wood, and the uh, natural materials. Now this is George Friend. George Friend was a vaudeville actor mm -hmm. who married one of John Spring's daughters. Uh, and took over as the real estate agent for the neighborhood and lived um, on the corner of Thousand Oaks and Santa Clara. And that mm -hmm. house is still there, oh, looks yeah. a little different. Um, and he was well known, and when I started interviewing people, he was still someone that people remembered. He had a convertible and would drive around the neighborhood mm -hmm. showing houses and properties and mm -hmm. was quite a charismatic character. So people remembered him well. There is one of the promotional pho photograph of his house. Hmm. Have you ever been inside that? I house? have been at that house. I have been inside that house. My, my daughter took music lessons there, and then more recently it was sold, yes. so it was open. Mm -hmm. And then this is the Peter B. Kind house, right across the street, and this was. Design. This is another John Hudson Thomas. Thomas was a Berkeley architect who, in the teens, did very avant-garde and unusual designs. Um, and I think this is just a fabulous design. It's hard to you know we don't get to see it from this angle anymore because of the vegetation. Um, but it's a Tudor house with those amazing finials. Um, it's a real <coughs> mis pastiche. <laughs> And Peter B. Kind was a novelist and one of the best, best known novelists of the Bay Area at this time. Mm -hmm. Wrote books called the Cappy Ricks books, and <laughs> they were very popular. So mm -hmm. he was not the original owner, but he was the second owner and was there by the middle of the teens. And then this house, just beyond the park, this is the Sill House, another John Henson Thomas design. Oh. It looks different than this now because it's been added on to, like tile roofs have been added. 
Um, but it's a very bold, aggressive house, and it's just stunning in this in this shot. I think it had one bedroom and a ballroom, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it has more bedrooms. I'm now, I'm sure, but <laughs> but it, it the ballroom entrance is from Yosemite, and the entrance of the house is on House of Elks. And so, if you're out walking, you can check that out. Who built that one? I'm sorry. Who was John the architect? Hudson, John. John Hudson Thomas. Oh, it was the same. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> and is that Williams College behind? And yeah. I love this picture because behind, way back there, as you noticed, is Williams College, and and this wonderful oak tree that's shading the front of the oh, shop. Wow. Yeah. And we even yeah. get a, a a car in the foreground, mm -hmm. so we get the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So this would be just around the bend, you know, oh, from the yeah. edge of Stone Face oh, Park. I do love this corner. I think it's a very evocative. Beautiful. And there are those steps going up to the ballroom now. So is the ballroom still there? What have they done? Do you know? It is still there. Oh, it is. Okay. I think it's it's now used as a you know a, an apartment. Oh. But until very recently, they were having performances there. So maybe they were on television. Mm -hmm. Yes, it has a stage. Fifty people. <laughs> you can see that this idea of, of simple houses blending with the natural. John Hudson Thomas was in a different phase of his career. He was not doing. He was doing some craftsman houses. We'll see one in a minute. This one, but a lot of his designs in his period were much more aggressive and stood way out. Yeah. This is this. I'm I'm di digressing a little bit because I wanted you to see a craftsman style John Hudson Thomas. This is down on Vincente. This is the Randolph House from 1914. Mm -hmm. With that beautiful wisteria. Um, it's really a great house. Okay. There we go. So this is Lover's Lane. Remember I said the connection between um, Yosemite stops right by Stoneface and then the, where the street bends was called Lover's Lane. And that Lover's Lane all the way around and then down that first block of Capistrano was Lover's Lane too. <laughs> and can you see the urns there at the top of Indian Trail? Yeah. And this is um, a house designed for another of John's friend's daughters. So we have one has married the man who became the real estate agent, George Friend. Another daughter married an architect named Noble Newsom, who um, was from a, an architectural family. His, his father and uncle designed the Carson Mansion in Eureka. And Noble Newsom and his brother, Sidney B. Newsom, or maybe it's his cousin, I'm not sure, um, went into the practice and designed houses. And this was just the honeymoon cottage for Noble Newsom and his bride, Anna Spring. And this is right on Lover's Lane. Mm -hmm. So the, the lot was a gift from John Spring to his daughter. And shortly after, the, a few, couple months after the wedding, John Spring and his wife separated because Spring had become enamored of his nurse. He had a year-long illness and um, decided that he would prefer the nurse to his <laughs> wife <laughs> and left the neighborhood for good. And that's when Mrs. Spring got the property in the divorce and she subdivided it, and that's why there are no more 20 acres around that house. Is this still there? Oh, yes. That's what I thought. I mean, it's fine. The upper part, part of it is a big fence. Yeah, yeah. No, the, I, I, the it looks so familiar. Yeah. I had to ask. It's, it's tricky because there's so much more vegetation now. Yeah. Well, and, they and this is the facade obscured of by, by trees and a fence. Yes. And um, well, and the street's leveled out, too, hasn't it? Yeah. No, it's not the there. Okay. I, this is a pretty wide intersection in here. Mm -hmm. So this would basically be across from, or just below, uh, the, the sill house, the one with the ball. Mm. Yeah, that's what I thought. Good. <laughs> And this is looking, again, if you can see, the, in the center is the house we just looked at in a close-up version. 
over on your right is the sill house. You see. So this is the other. This the is the other block, block of Yosemite of with no houses on it at that point. And I, what I really wanted to point out was that wedge of eucalyptus trees that mm. would be just, um, you know, going down the hill from the Indian Trail area. I think the last three were in Brakes property. Weren't they right next to you? The Brakes took them out. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Sure. But it's, it, I was noticing today as I put these slides together, I'd forgotten how many eucalyptus trees, and now I look that way from my house. I can't, they're not. They're not. But now they're big pines and firs and other things. Well, one thing that's fun when you when you talk to people about the past, they sometimes offer you picture, family photos, and mm -hmm. so this is a young woman named Georgia Bacon with her uncle standing next to one of those urns, and I don't know the location, but it's got to be the early days because there's not much around mm -hmm. them. And his pipe, and his pipe, and her haircut. <laughs> I was. <laughs> And this is the Alameda, um, looking toward Capistrano. On the right <coughs> is, is that, you can see the eucalyptus trees up there again, and the two houses that, that are on in, along Indian Trail on the Alameda side. So this is about 1915, 16. And this is looking up Indian Trail, toward Indian Trail from the campus, the uh, San Lorenzo, I think, mm -hmm. that corner. So that's the, there's some beautiful houses on either side of Indian Trail. One is a Gutterson, and the other one was remodeled by John Hudson Thomas. And this is a chalet mm -hmm. on the Alameda. You know this house? Is that the front? What? Is that the front of it? That's the front of it. Um, I brought with me tonight um, something I, if you're interested, I'd be happy to make some copies of it. A walking tour of Thousand Oaks, which ha which I did for Baja, and it has a lot of the addresses of these houses okay. because I realize I know them so well that you're not going to be able to, you may not recognize them, especially in different surroundings. Now there's an interesting story to this house. We're down. This is down on Vincente again. Um, in the 1915 Pan Pacific Exposition, the Oregon Pavilion was made of logs. And oh. after the, the the fair was over, at the end of 1915, the Oregon Pavilion was taken apart, and the logs were floated across the bay and built into a house by James Plachek, another Berkeley architect, on Vincente. Mm -hmm. And the house is still there, but by the 50s and 40s, the logs had rotted, and so it doesn't look like this now. Mm -hmm. But here's what it looked like originally. And again, so this is Thousand Oaks in 1916. A lot of open space around it. Hmm. <laughs> and then that along that in that area. There are a number of big rocks that were markers for the northern edge of the Peralta Rancho. So we're in the very northern edge of the Peralta Rancho. And in 1861, there was a lawsuit, and Carlton Watkins, who's a well-known photographer of the West, was hired to document the property. And these, this is one of Watkins' photos of what it looked like at going down toward Albany Hill. Um, that was part of an evidence in that lawsuit. Hmm. Um, I just wanted to show you that it really was mostly grassland. Yeah. So the deer were here before. So we should have more seagulls. This is called Monument. This is Monument Rock next door to that house made of logs. And it was one of the markers of the Peralta Rancho has now been built on it. Can you see that? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Is that still there? What? 
Which street is that? Huh? Vincenti. Oh, yeah. Vincenti Peralta. <coughs> so, I think around 19, well, maybe 1918. So the reason we have so many brochures and so many old photos mm -hmm. is that things were not moving fast. Uh, there was really very little building that took place during World War I. There was some, but not a lot. And this neighborhood, so we have a lot of great early houses, and then in the 20s comes the time when things really build up. And by, by 1930, most of the lots are built upon. So mm -hmm. I think your block is probably that's the case here as well. Um, and certainly it's the case all along. So we're looking up toward Arlington. You can see walking paths there. And I just wanted to show you a few houses that look a little well. This is a Julia, Julia Morgan house on Thousand Oaks, mm -hmm. just up here, up on the top. Mm -hmm. um, taken many years ago but in a Mediterranean style. So again, remember I said there were no, there were some restrictions and some requirements about placement and cost, but in terms of style and architect, it was up to the owner, the builder, to choose a builder or a design. And what that gives us is an amazing diversity, but because there was a conversation about what might work here, there's also a kind of a harmonious whole and I think it's important to think about that. Um, I think it's what we have a good plan for the neighborhood with the curving streets and the open parklands, but we also have um, some really wonderful buildings just all around. So the, as you can see, there was plenty of material for a walking tour. And then this house on the Alameda, um, which is another noble Newsome. I was for years thought it was somebody else, but it turns out to be Mr. Newsom in 1930. Um, remember, he's the one who lived in the honeymoon house on, on the corner on Lover's Lane. And this is at the very base of Yosemite on the Alameda with the deer in front. The, oh, right. The statue of the deer. Well, it's kind of uh, walled up or something now. Is somebody living there? I think so. Oh, yes, yeah. Maybe I know. There's one that's got uh, wire or iron fencing around it. And it may not be this one. I don't one. think it's this one. Yeah, that's another one down that row. Um, and then and then this is my house, I have to say. I wanted you to know mm -hmm. where, where I live. Mm -hmm. um, and really what got me into all of this was that when we bought this house in 1972, we were told that it had been designed by Julia Morgan, but there were no plans, and there are no building per permits for this neighborhood mm -hmm. until about 1922 because it was part of the county. So, And what year was your house? 1920. So when I was trying to research this, that that was part of the reason I got asked to do that walking tour because I had been digging around trying to see what I could find out. Um, but you know, anyway, it turns out that it was indeed designed by Julie Morgan, but it took me eight years to find that out. <laughs> How did you find out? What um, she has a client list, and I found out that the owner, where the owners had lived before they lived here, and she, on the client list, was the name of the owners of our house in their previous address on Channing Way. Super. It took eight years to work. <laughs> but in the meantime, I learned a lot of other things. Oh, yeah. Yes, did. yeah that's fabulous. But in a way, this is a conceit, because doesn't it look like this is just a level neighborhood? Mm -hmm. But it doesn't work that way. It drops off in the back. And, uh, well, they must have been sort of up the hill photographing it. Yeah. Oh, and then this, yeah. is, this is John Hudson Thomas in the 1920s. He completely changed his style mm -hmm. and starts building cottages, very mm -hmm. romantic. Um, and this is a cluster of four of those 20s buildings on our block of Yosemite hmm. um, on the upside. And they're really scattered all over the neighborhood. But the contrast mm -hmm. from this to the Sill House is, or the Theater B. Kind House, is really striking. And then this is Noble Newsom in 1930. And you reckon this is the house right across from the park? 
a very handsome house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is the Searles house mm -hmm. in the back on Indian Trail. Um, this was designed by Walter Steilberg, 1922. Um, Steilberg had worked with Julia Morgan, and but then went out on his own in 1920. And the, the Levins family bought this ha bought the lot and decided to ask him to build the house. And it's really an amazing house if you. Uh, he made the stucco to be the color of the rocks. Mm. Uh, the trim is, and he put a lot of green Chinese tiles, and then a lot of redwood on the interior of the house. And it's a really nice California house. Right on the, on the left side, as you, as you go down the Indian Trail, is where the St. Oh. Bernard lives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've met him. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one of those windows, so. Oh, that's a great house. That's a lovely, that's a lovely house. <coughs> but times change. And the, mm -hmm. the Bay Bridge is being built in, in the mid-30s. Uh, here it is under construction. Here's Solano Avenue without any trains on it. The Oaks Theater and no, no station to power the SP lines. But you can still see a view. <laughs> Here's one of the old cars put out to pasture, mm -hmm. the train cars. Um, but I like to think that um, this is a picture probably from about 1918, mm -hmm. coming down Indian Trail. I don't know who she is. Um, but there's the original urn, the one we still have, when it had its lip on it. And when you think about the combination of the, the urns and the oaks and the rocks and the curving streets and all the things that went into making Thousand Oaks, um, I think we're very lucky to have all these amenities. And I, you know, you can tell that I think it's a great place to live. I really do. I think we're very lucky to be here. Um, and I want to say a little bit something about the urn project because some of you know this, but when I started doing this digging to find out what was here, there was only one urn. But as I spoke to people, and as I began to collect photographs, it was clear that there was more than one urn originally. And it became, there were people in the neighborhood that became interested in, let's have a few more urns. And so, as you know, in 1911, we added two urns, the one at Stoneface and the one in the little park at the end of the street. And this last year, 2018, we added two more, one up on Arlington mm -hmm. to stand in for all the urns that were in Arlington, and one in the little park on Yosemite and Arlington where there was one originally. And I will just make a plea. Elizabeth Sloot and I have done this for all these years, but we're ready to retire. <laughs> and we would love to have somebody else um, take over. So if this is the kind of thing that might intrigue you, or you know somebody who'd like to work on it, we can provide lots of advice and even some money, um, because I think our neighborhood could actually use a few more of us. <laughs> Where so. would they be? Um, that's Where's always the question, and it's trickier now than, than it was originally. I think they could put them wherever they wanted. Um, but there could be more on Arlington. Historically, there could be more on Arlington. Um, there could be some on the Alameda. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yes, and then. Do you know any history of that? I do. The owners, the former owners of the house on in that house that's on Indian Trail put that there when they were working on their house. And it's a little confusing because it's not an original, yeah. you know, oh, it's just, it it's a smaller scale. Yeah. yeah. They like the idea of urns, so they added one of their own. Mm -hmm. You're not going up and down that trail, are you? Huh? You're not going up and down that trail, <laughs> are you? I wouldn't put it past you, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, 
that's a very general overview. But I just want to, I just hope when you go around, you drive around, when you walk around, you see some things maybe you didn't notice before, you think about how this was planned as a whole, and um, just hope it just increases your appreciation of what we have here. So I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. But thank you so thank much. You too. Thank you. Sorry? When was it incorporated in the city, Berkeley? Oh, 1920. But the, I don't think the street names were changed until about 1922. Mm -hmm. Having done, you know, dug into the old Berkeley directories to find people's addresses. And I, I see that ours, for example, was San Rafael until about 1922. And then it became Yosemite. That makes sense? Yeah. Why did they change them, though? I mean, I, you know, I don't know. I think some of them, to, 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 to agree with the streets to the south, maybe they thought it made more sense to have. They could, so they did it. <laughs> no one has ever offered a good explanation. Well, I'd be happy to answer questions individually, but thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Good. Well, no, no.